All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Kindness, Empathy, and Social Emotional Learning webinar. We are so glad to have you all here with us today. My name is Sarah Eversall, and I'm with McGraw-Hill Education. So before we begin, I do want to emphasize just one housekeeping item. Um, we absolutely encourage you to reach out to us and ask any questions that you might have during this webinar. So you can feel free to use the chat box to do so, which is underneath that white Great Kindness Challenge logo. And you can throw anything you want to in there. You can also communicate with each other. And um, then you can also use the Q&A box as well. The Q&A box, um, your other attendees won't be able to see the questions. So let's get started. In our webinar today, we'll hear from Milena Batanova, who is representing Making Caring Common, which is an initiative of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Milena leads the Instructional Strategies to Promote Empathy Initiative and is a former research assistant professor at the Institute for Applied Research and Youth Development at Tufts University, which is a mouthful, but we are so happy to have Milena here. This is wonderful. Jill McManigal will also be speaking today, and Jill is the co-founder and executive director of Kids for Peace, which is the home to the ever-wonderful Great Kindness Challenge. Jill is a former playwright, elementary school teacher, and character education specialist. So thank you for being here, Jill. We love to have you. We'll also have Margaret Johnson here with us today representing Sanford Harmony. Margaret is the Western Regional Ambassador for Sanford Harmony and has trained over 2,000 educators to use Harmony in her their classroom. Margaret has served as an elementary school teacher, a reading specialist, and a principal, among many other leadership roles. We're very fortunate to have Margaret here with us today as well. So before I pass it over to our speakers, we wanted to do a quick poll to get to know all of you. So if you could answer this first question, what grade level is your school? Your options are preschool, elementary school, middle school, high school, or other. And while you are answering that question, I wanted to draw your attention to a few resources that you can access uh, during or after the webinar. So in the chat box underneath the Great Kindness Challenge logo, I've actually dropped a few links. The first is a link to the Great Kindness Challenge website, and the second is a link to Sanford Harmony's website to be able to learn a little bit more about the organizations after the webinar. And you can also access all of those links uh, if you see at the top of your screen, there's some red icons. The one that looks like a stack of paper will also have all of those links as well. So right now it looks like we actually have a lot of high school and elementary school, which is really exciting. Um, no matter what age group you're mostly working with, you're going to find something, I think, in this webinar that's going to be really helpful for you. So we're excited to have everybody here with us today. I'm going to give you one more moment to answer that poll. Okay, one, one more chance. I'm going to advance here. Okay. So it looks like we have mostly elementary school and high school, majority elementary school. That's great to see everybody. A few preschool and a few middle school. Uh, in, the, in the chat box, we're getting an elementary school social worker. Welcome, Tina. Okay, and now for our next poll, we'd like to find out how familiar you are with social emotional learning. So if you could tell us on a scale of one to five, with uh, five being extremely and one being not at all, how knowledgeable would you say that you are with social emotional learning? So while you are answering that one, I did want to draw your attention back to that chat box. There's two other links. One is the link uh, to Making Caring Common, and the other is the link to um, the McGraw-Hill Inspired Ideas blog, which has a lot of resources, some from teachers, some from my Applied Learning Sciences team, about inspired um, about social emotional learning that I think you guys will find really helpful. And you can, again, get those in the chat box, or you can find them in that stack of paper looking document, um, looking icon that I think will be really helpful for you all. So at the moment, it looks like we have a lot of fours. That's awesome. You guys are pretty confident. That's great. Uh, and again, with this one, you know, if, if this is really new to you, then we have something for you. And if you feel like you're pretty confident and you're ready to take it to the next level, then we have something for you as well. So that's great. I'll give you one more second. And I'm going to advance here. Great. So you can see we've got 44% of people feel that they're pretty confident. That's awesome. Um, yeah, this is great. Good for you guys. I can't wait for you to hear what you guys feel like you learned from this. And then this last poll, 
we're going to ask on a scale of one to five, with one being not at all. Oh, make it. Okay, there we go. Um, how confident would you say you are in actually implementing SEL into your classroom? So this is, you know, not only do you feel like you're knowledgeable, but you feel like you can take it to the next step and really make a difference in your students' lives with this one. And again, um, I feel like, I think it's a, there we go. Um, I feel, I think we're going to do, uh, we're going to have something for everyone here. Great. So it looks like we have um, kind of evenly split across the board here. It's really good. Let me give you one more moment to respond. We've got great responses in the chat box. Um, some people want to do the Great Kindness Challenge across all grades, which I highly recommend. The older kids can benefit from it too. Sometimes they have some of the coolest ideas. Okay, and I'm going to advance here. Great, so we're right in the middle. Awesome, okay. Thank you everyone for participating in those polls. All right, now for our webinar goals, we're going to learn about current research, strategies, and initiatives in the area of social emotional learning. We're also going to be able to walk away with the ideas, resources, and effective ways to foster and implement SEL with your students. And for our agenda, we're going to start with Harvard's Making Caring Common, then we'll move to Stanford Harmony. After that, we'll touch base with Jill from the Great Kindness Challenge, and we'll finish up with any questions you might have. So again, just feel free to drop those questions in the chat box as they come up for you, and we might hold them until the end, and then we'll make sure they get to the right person. All right, guys, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Milena, and thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thank you so much. I feel so honored to be on this webinar with you all and seeing what a great representation we have. So I really hope this benefits all of you in some ways. Um, so first to start, and I know quite a few of you said you feel pretty knowledgeable, so I'm sorry if some of this is repetitive. Uh, but maybe there is some new information here that you might not be so aware of. So the definition of social-emotional learning I've provided here is perhaps the most widely used, uh, promoted by the Collaborative for Social-Emotional Learning. And I highly, highly recommend, um, you know, for anyone getting familiar um, with SCL to, to get more familiar with CASEL specifically. They have some great resources, and I do reference them throughout um, this presentation. Um, as you can see from their beautiful colored wheel, there are five core competencies that they propose, and I'll go into their definitions or descriptions in a little bit, but I wanted to emphasize that it really is a systemic framework for promoting positive development. So just as important as the SEL competencies are and of themselves, the context for teaching them and all other levels of the ecology are equally important. So basically, SEL is not any one single program or teaching method per se. It involves coordinated strategies across you know, classes, schools, districts, families, ideally connecting schools to families and building on that homeschool connection and so on. Um, so you might be surprised to learn um, that while SEL is widely prevalent at the preschool level, meaning all 50 states have some level of preschool learning goals for SCL, it's actually still largely missing at the K through 12 level, especially in middle and high schools. Not to say the schools are not implementing some form of SCL, because many of them are. In fact, virtually all states have integrated at least some degree of um, social emotional content into their standards, but the content, you know, it's still, um, Somewhat, you know, it's not comprehensive enough, especially across all five SCL domains, um, and it can be rather scattered. Um, so that's why Castle strongly, strongly recommends that there be freestanding uh, learning goals or standards for SCL with developmental benchmarks in mind. Um, so. Moving on uh, to my next slide, I thought um, it'd be nice to share this visual with you that I think really nicely represents many of the terminology issues in this field. Um, and it's a very recent one. It was an NPR ed. Um, and I liked it because it does represent all of these different 
terms and voices and ideas. So to some people, you know, SEL involves a set of tools for more productive learning. To others, it's a way of promoting resilience um, in the face of, you know, both normative and traumatic experiences. And then to others, um, you know, they see it as a morality and a character building exercise. So, you know, these things definitely don't need to be mutually exclusive. In fact, many of them are interrelated. For our purposes, we focus on SEL uh, in general because the vast amount of research into action that has been spearheaded by Castle and others um, has really informed so many school efforts. And there are so many schools that already have elements of SCL infused into their practice. Um, and I think you just need you know, more guidance and support to do more. Um, so that said, uh, before we get into you know, some of the necessary components of SCL and the challenges and all that, um, I thought I would give uh, some more information on those five competencies. Um, so again, I'm, uh, I apologize if some of this is, is redundant to some, um, but it's important to, to know what some of the main constructs or sub-competencies are in each of these areas. And the ones I italicized are the ones that are most, um, I would say, um, you know, timely or that um, are really um, referenced in the literature um, that we know. So, um, as you can see, self-awareness is all about identifying one's feelings and having an accurate view of yourself, recognizing strengths and limitations, um, having a well-grounded sense of confidence and, and, and optimism, and a growth mindset, right? So instead of being fixed, uh, you, you, you believe that um, you can learn and develop new skills and behaviors and whatnot. Uh, Self-management is the ability to successfully regulate or manage one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. And much of that is grounded in constructive goal setting, self-regulation, and of course, grit. Um, we have social awareness, uh, which is the ability to empathize with others and to take their perspective, to appreciate diversity and respect others, um, and to express compassion and kindness. Uh, and then we have our relationship skills, which are all about establishing and maintaining healthy relationships. Um, and to do that, you know, you, we need the ability to communicate clearly, to listen well, to cooperate, um, to, to negotiate conflict constructively, and to engage in respectful civil discourse. And finally, there's decision making, which is all about constructive choices, um, you know, about one's own actions and interactions with others. And it's very much based on ethical standards, right, um, and safety concerns and social norms. So in a few slides, I will specifically focus on the social awareness piece um, or empathy at its core. But you'll, you'll see how it actually involves all of these other competencies. Um, before that, I thought I would also do a quick poll to see how many of you maybe target one or more of these competencies in schools. Um, so um, I here overview some, you know, of the more um, popular or leading SEL programs. Um, and I want to know, you know, how many of you have implemented or are currently implementing um, this first bullet of um, programs. So we have Open Circle, Responsive Classroom, Caring School Community, or I Can Problem Solve. Um, so these are most commonly used in elementary schools. Um, so I know that there are quite a few from uh, the elementary school level. So I'm curious um, if you use any of those. Um, you know, some others are secure or positive action or mind up. Uh, feel free to um, vote on that. And then the second, uh, the second bullet represents programs that are also elementary based, elementary school based. Um, but that go into the middle school, um, so even eighth grade, right? So we have PATH, uh, which uh, I think if I recall correctly, it stands for Promoting Alternative Thinking Strategies. We have four R's, uh, which are Reading, Writing, Respect, and Resolution. We have Second Step, Ruler, and Lion's Quest. And then that third bullet represents um, uh, the few um, uh, offerings for high schools. Um, we have Facing History in Ourselves and Project-Based Learning, 
uh, specifically by the Buck Institution for Education. I know they have um, an SDL type program. So interestingly, it, it looks like from the results, um, and I think hopefully if I, there we go. I want to give everyone maybe a, a few more seconds to vote because um, I do see results coming in. And and now I will I will just move on to the results. So I'm sorry if someone hasn't had a chance to uh, put in um, their tab, but it looks like um, so quite quite a few. 28% um, um, have done um, any one of these that are for elementary and middle school, um, and 19% uh, have done one of those specific to the elementary school level, which is great. Um, but obviously, you know. Um, we know in high schools um, there aren't as many offerings, and um, I'm glad you know there's still some who've implemented these. And there's obviously room to do more, right? Um, and there there are other programs, of course. These aren't the only ones. Um, and so I wanted to um, also show you some additional great resources if you want to know more about what other programs are out there. I um, highly recommend this report um, that came out by Stephanie Jones and colleagues. Um, it's a really nice report on 25 leading SEL programs. Um, CASEL, of course, has program guides. They have an elementary school edition and they have an edition for uh, middle and high schools. Um, and they also have a site on assessing or measuring SEL, how you can actually go about doing that. Um, so, moving on. Um, it is important to, you know, acknowledge why even do this, you know, because some of you might be wondering, well, what really are the benefits? Like, is this really important? Well, the benefits are, are vast. Uh, beyond the significant increase in test scores, uh, there are a number of significant improvements for both students and teachers alike, as well as their perceptions of the school climate and classroom management. Um, emotional distress, um, problem behaviors, um, those things in students do go down. And, you know, economically speaking, not only is there a huge benefit uh, to cost ratio, but also long-term benefits have been found like um, higher earnings, um, more happiness uh, at work or with, team or with um, colleagues, uh, better overall physical and mental health, and all of those things mean, you know, less government spending. Um, but the catch in all of this of course, is that programs do need to be well designed and they need to be well implemented. So the programs mentioned so far, I picked because a good amount of research has been done on them and um, they are considered SAFE, uh, which stands for, you know, having sequenced activities, um, actively engaging students, um, uh, providing focused time on SEL, and being explicit in the skills and competencies that are being targeted. Um, but, you know, they also need to be well implemented or delivered with high quality. And of course, this is something that's really hard to assess, what is high quality without necessarily having observers there or um, really, you know, diving into the content more critically. Um, and a lot of studies, they do, if they do report anything on implementation or instruction, it's usually the problems or the failures of impl implementation. And, and those are the, prog the programs that we know don't fare too well. So what are the necessary components to fare well? Um, so hopefully this is where um, I provide you with some more interesting information. And for one, lessons need to be freestanding with age-appropriate developmental benchmarks. Right, so there needs to be some built-in continuity in how SEL skills are being developed. Um, ideally, lessons should be vertically aligned, uh, meaning that early childhood and elementary school lessons intentionally lay the groundwork for later lessons. Um, and middle and high school lessons, you know, we know they're challenging and tough to do, um, especially because they need to be very relevant for students. Um, Second, it is critical that lessons be integrated and aligned with academic curricula. For example, so even in math class, teachers can use stories about 
mathematicians or, you know, stories with puzzles or problem solving scenarios to have students really identify with them and maybe discuss in small groups. So certainly some lessons or programs might be more challenging to integrate in some subjects over others especially at the middle and high school level. And that's where positive teaching practices and day-to-day -day interactions come in. Um, things like setting routines, right, like morning check-ins or positive ground rules, making use of different instructional practices, um, applying the lessons to other subject areas in creative ways, uh, modeling good behavior, showing students what positive relationships look like, right? By interacting with them positively, but also having good staff relations. Um, and all of these things obviously play into the systems level approach, right? For instance, thinking about the culture and the climate of the school, what norms are being set? What are the routines, structures, and systems in place within classes, across classes, across grades, and all these other areas? Um, even, you know, playgrounds or other free spaces or uh, the buses. So with all of this alignment and thinking within and across levels, um, school staff can really start to think more about adopting and continuously improving their efforts. But, you know, I, we recognize that there are many challenges to this. Um, and one of the big challenges really is having this shared voice and vision among state stakeholders. Um, so the need for teachers, but even students, to have buy-in and decision-making power into what programs or efforts are being instituted. So they can really truly become embedded in meaningful ways. Um, the second challenge is the time that it takes to plan, right? To plan, to coordinate, to train, to implement, um, and basically to repeat it all again. So, to, so, so you can ensure that there's ongoing, continuous quality improvement and sustainability of all of these efforts. Because you also don't want to have a program come in and then disappear a year later. Um, and of course, you know, there's all these competing demands on time and resources. They're very realistic barriers. And especially when you have financial and logistical issues at play, like, you know, you need to train your staff, you need to provide assistance throughout, who's going to do that, um, and are they doing it at the right time? And, of course, you also have wide variation in implementation quality. I already spoke to this a little bit, um, but, I, you know, I really believe that a lot of this variation has to do with the mismatches between the lessons being provided or given to teachers and the actual needs of the classroom or the teacher's readiness to implement those lessons that they've been given, right? And not having that teacher autonomy or flexibility to do what works for them at a given time. Um, so all that said, you know, that's, those challenges are a nice segue into why we felt the need to develop our empathy-based strategies. Um, they are intentionally designed to be low burden and light lift to teachers in middle and high school classrooms. Um, in no way are they meant to replace programs, but rather, um, you know, they're intended to maybe supplement or strengthen or perhaps catalyze um, the need for SDL efforts or any continuum of approaches um, that I've kind of spoken to a little bit. Um, so because there is such a need for helping to establish these routines or structures, um, we also provide a list of games that teachers can play with their students multiple times a week. Um, sorry, I'm just taking a breath. <laughs> um, in general, the games and the strategies are uh, specifically allow teachers to select what works for them at different times of the year. Um, the strat each strategy is made up of activities or lessons that can be done in approximately five-week cycles. So each strategy is up to five lessons and each lesson can be done once a week for 15 to 20 minutes. The strategies rely heavily on the power of peer discussion, the importance of reflection, and the need to apply the content to student lives, uh, which I mentioned is so especially important for middle and high school students. We currently have 12 of these strategies, and some examples um, include everyday gratitude, 
listening deeply, and circle of concern. So this last example, it's currently on our website in its longer version, but we do have shortened it to make it um, applicable for shorter exercises that can be done in the classroom. And the, be the idea behind it is that it's important literally to expand students' circles of concern, meaning to help them think through who's in their immediate circle, who are they close to, and thus who do they have more empathy for, and how can they empathize with those outside their immediate circles, like say the bus driver or a new student from another country that they're yet to speak to. Um, so the strategy provides some good opportunities for students to practice expanding their circles of concern and then to apply them into other areas of their lives. Um, and so why empathy? I also just wanted to give you a little bit of background on why we focus on empathy. You know, there's plenty of research to show it's obviously important for interpersonal relationships. It's linked to pro-social behavior and altruism. And the more affective or emotional component um, is linked to less aggression and less bullying. Um, and I really like that definition by Hoffman, that it is the spark of human concern for others and the glue that makes social life possible. Um, so um, I wish I had time to really go through these components with you, but I just thought it is important to draw your attention to the fact that empathy is multifaceted. While we oftentimes think of it as perspective taking or putting yourself in someone's shoes to understand what they're going through, that really is just more of the cognitive component, which certainly is important, but without also nurturing and building the affective or emotional pieces to empathy, uh, we can actually do a lot of harm. Um, and so, you know, we can be skilled at understanding others' perspectives or feelings, but we also need to value and care for others so we can actually show compassion, especially to those who might be different from us. And um, here, really quickly, I just wanted to show that um, based on the previous slide, you know, the competencies involved in empathy are also self-awareness and self-management and relationships. But beyond just understanding and feeling, we see empathy as really comprising of these moral aspects of development, right? So it's really about valuing connection and other people's opinions and feelings, and then showing compassion by, by linking empathy to action. Um, and, you know, for instance, part of expanding student circles is creating the expectation that all students are part of the same community. They have a responsibility to one another and they need to act on that responsibility. Um, and, you know, embedded in these notions are the need to help students overcome barriers. And so I list them here, but I, I think I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to draw your attention to these as well, because many of our strategies try to get at these, you know, like the listening deeply one. Um, we have one on stereotypes to address stereotyping and prejudice, um, and generally this lack of exposure experience with diversity. Um, and so if you want to learn more, uh, please feel free to go to our website. Um, or email me at research at makingcaringcommon.org. Um, I also wanted to tell you that we have um, campaigns specifically for high schools, um, and there are a good third of you on this webinar. So um, this might be of interest. Please visit our Turning the Tide campaign. Um, we are trying to work with schools to promote any one of these three domains. Um, to de you know to help schools develop greater concern for others to increase equity and access, um, and to reduce excessive achievement pressure, especially in those communities that experience high levels of achievement stress. Um, and finally, um, I also wanted to just give you really quick resources and tools specific to SCL and integrating it into your general teaching practices or curricula, um, and also trying to um, implement on a district level. Um, so with that, um, I will move, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to pass on the torch to Margaret Johnson from Stanford Harmony. Welcome everybody and thanks so much Melinda for really setting the groundwork. We're going to share a little bit about building healthy relationships 
with Sanford Harmony. So Harmony is a pre-K through sixth grade program that's being used in schools and organizations throughout the United States. It's designed to set the stage for positive relationships throughout a lifetime. We know that we want students to help one another, to respect one another, solve problems. We want each and every child to feel included in our classroom and school community and to be focused. And with Harmony, teachers can teach and students can learn. Let's take a visit into a Harmony classroom. We have a brief video to share with you. Welcome to Miss Moreville's second grade class at Aggie Roberts Elementary in Clark County, Nevada, where one of the largest school districts in the nation is helping lead a global movement. The goal is both ambitious and childlike in its simplicity. They just want people to be nice. Really, the immediate impact is that students are aware of what it means to be kind and be nice. Often we say, just be nice to your friends or be a good friend, and we don't really tell them what that means or spend any time teaching them about that. So I think students are a lot more aware of how to be a kind person and, and a respectful person. Thank you, honey. Oh, thank you. Clark County is just one of many districts across the United States to adopt the Sanford Harmony Program. You are very good. Philanthropist T. Denny yeah. Sanford and the National University system good work have partnered to invest millions of dollars to make this comprehensive social emotional learning program available free of charge and its impact is already being felt harmony is actually giving my class a, a sense of community that there wasn't there before and so the amazing thing with Harmony is my kids are able to take these strategies that they're learning here in the classroom in our morning meetups and then they're using them outside of our classroom. They're using them on the playground. They're using them at home even. They come and tell me stories where they followed a Harmony goal and they were able to problem solve the situation. Be kind. Be fair. Respect others. Listen to others. Include everyone. If you can follow our goals, our Classroom Harmony goals, then you are setting yourself up for success. But what about those who say they just barely have enough time to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic? What the studies have proven is that through these programs, there's more actual time in the room to learn and to teach because there's a lot less disruption in the classroom. I think it needs to spread throughout the world. I mean, everyone in the world needs to understand how to be respectful and, to, and kind to one another. The motto at Sanford Harmony is changing the world, one classroom at a time. And it looks like they're well on their way. So during the video, you had a chance to visit a second grade classroom you also met Denny Sanford. And Denny is the philanthropist, along with National University, that makes Harmony a cost-free program that's donated to schools and organizations throughout the country uh, by Denny and National University. We'd like to share why Harmony works. Everything is about intentional relationship and community building. We're promoting Student Voice, uh, Harmony supports the CASEL social emotional learning competencies. Teachers are given toolkits as well as specialists and other school um, organizations where there are strategies, lessons, activities, stories, and songs. We have prof a professional le learning library and a social emotional learning app that goes along with Harmony and what teachers really enjoy is that it's flexible to fit teacher and student needs. <clears throat> Just uh, another uh, picture of Denny Sanford, who is all about building strong relationships in classrooms, and he does make this program no cost for schools and organizations. Let's look at Harmony. So each teacher um, and specialist would receive uh, a teacher toolkit 
that spot the curriculum spirals and it's very connected and again that's no cost and we'll look at the components of harmony we have our everyday practices and the lessons and activities that go through the different grade levels our first strategy that we use every day is buddy up and buddy up is all about pairing students with a different peer each week so they can engage in brief activities on a daily basis. So why would we want to buddy up? It brings together diverse, diverse peers. And in that, we, if you notice at your school, students like adults tend to hang out with those students that are most like themselves. Buddy up gives them the opportunity to engage in brief activities with a different person. We're building new friendships, and we're promoting consideration, caring, and empathy. So let's take a moment and buddy up during our webinar. Take a moment and think, what is something that makes you feel loved or appreciated? It's almost Thanksgiving. So we thought this would be a nice buddy up or a quick connection to make. So please write your response in the chat box or under the video box. Okay, Margaret, we have some responses coming in. A lot of you say that family makes you feel loved and appreciated. Some of you also say when someone thanks you for doing a good job or when your hard work is recognized, that's when you also feel loved and appreciated. Some of you are also saying helping others. Um, again, another one, acknowledgement of hard work. So yes, thank you so much for your responses, everybody. So that was an example of a quick connection card that's included in your kits. We have a, a primary and upper grade cards that are used that are wonderful examples in the teacher toolkit that can be used every day. Our next strategy is meet up or circle time or community or you could call it your community circle. Students meet in a circle to greet one another, share ideas, monitor harmony goals, uh, solve problems, and engage in community building activities during meetup. Why would we meet up? We want to strengthen our classroom community, identify commonalities, celebrate individuals and differences. We want to practice communication and we want to promote uh, problem solving. So Meetup has four distinct steps from greetings, sharing and responding, community check-in, and that's where we stop and monitor our classroom harmony goals that children have established, how they want to treat one another, and we discuss what's going well and give examples of that and the problems we need to solve. Those are called our lows. And then at the end, we have a quick connection, much like we did a moment ago. So here's our greeting, where students are greeting each other by name. Next, we have a sharing and responding time, where students are sharing about their day or things they want to share with the class. We have some very definite steps for that. During the next part, 
our community checks in. As you can see, we have one of our after-school leaders sharing Harmony goals. Theirs are to be kind, include others, um, helping others as a few examples. So we're monitoring those goals. And we're talking about what's going well in our classroom and having students share specific examples of how we're supporting one another. And we're also talking about what are some problems we need to solve or our lows. At the end of a meetup, there's a quick connection. And this is just an example. This one is, what is your favorite holiday tradition? Again, we have quick connection cards that are part of our kits, as well as the meetup and buddy up strategies. We also have Harmony units that are developed for the grade levels. Um, if you go to our website, you'll find our Harmony scope and sequence and our Castle alignment guide. Those units include diversity and inclusion, empathy and critical thinking, communication, problem solving, and peer relationships. There are a variety of lessons and activities, and these focus themes weave throughout the grade levels to sixth grade. So here's an example specifically from Unit 4, which is problem solving. You can see in this unit that we want students to be able to identify problems, solve them, cooperate, and talk about what it's like to be considerate and to understand others. Let's look at a few examples. In second grade, uh, through that Unit 4, we introduce this problem-solving strategy through a variety of lessons and activities where we stop, talk, and we're thinking about each other's perspectives, thinking about solutions, and trying solutions to see how it works. What we like about this is it can be easily integrated into different times of the day. In grade four, we use a different problem-solving approach where we're looking at how different students use different approaches to solve problems, and that's just fine. From the solution finder owl to the conflict controller shark and the conflict avoider turtle, each one of these strategies can be used in different ways. We also have, with our pre-K, through second grade, a series of storybooks where Z, who comes from outer space and is clueless about making friends, is introduced to students, to children that live in the treehouse. And Z gets into all kinds of pickles and needs to learn about friendship. So the stories match the units in pre-K through second grade, and there are a variety of lessons, activities, and songs that talk about Z and support the themes. And our Harmony app also shares stories. So it's a valuable tool uh, to use at home with uh, our parents. And they can also check out the quick connection cards and be engaged with their students. So we're hoping you're interested in building healthy relationships with Sanford Harmony. And you'll notice at the bottom, we've included our website. And our question and answers will be held at the end of the workshop. But we've enjoyed sharing Sanford Harmony with you and hope, and hope you'll have an opportunity to introduce it to your school. Now I'd like to pass the webinar on to Jill. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was wonderful. And thank you so much, Melena. Um, I learned um, so much from you, and I'm really grateful. And Sarah and McGraw-Hill, we are beyond grateful to you for hosting this webinar and being such a supporter of kindness and empathy and social-emotional learning in schools. Um, you are really making a difference, and we're so grateful. And I am thrilled to be able to share with all of you about the Great Kindness Challenge which is a way that you can put social emotional learning into action for all grades pre-K through high school. So some of you probably already know about the Great Kindness Challenge and some of you, this might be the first time hearing about it. 
So for a general overview, we want you to know that it's a nationwide program. It's proactive and positive, and it's an empowering kindness initiative. Um, as I mentioned, it's for all grades, pre-K through high school. Um, it's really easy to implement, which is one of the reasons it's expanded so rapidly. And also, it's great on your budget because it's free. And the free is um, made possible because of our wonderful sponsors. We have Be Fear to Be Kind, which is a partnership of, of Hasbro and Dignity Health also, with human kindness as their motto. So we um, want to tell you a little bit about why the Great Kindness Challenge works for social emotional learning. And um, based on our last year's survey, 98% of schools um, said that they found an improvement in their school climate, which is a huge, huge number of improvement, showing improvement. And 86% showed an increase in their staff morale. And we know that happy teachers make for happy students. So all of that is very, very important. Um, on the survey, we also found that the Great Kindness Challenge elevates school climate and unites the whole community. It decreases bullying and increases compassion. It minimizes behavioral referrals, and it makes kindness a habit. And last year, our 2017 impact, um, the Great Kindness Challenge takes place the last week of January. So in 2017, we had over 10 million students participate. There were over 15,000 schools participating. Um, combined, they accomplished over 500 million acts of kindness, a half a billion acts of kindness, and there were 91 countries that participated next um, last year. Um, the Great Kindness Challenge is seen by many as the happiest week of the year, and we really like to emphasize the happy part because studies also show that happy students learn better and a happy environment creates a more positive learning experience. So sometimes we forget to really put the emphasis on the joy of learning and the joy of relationships, and the Great Kindness Challenge does just that. Um, we also are, as we learn more about social emotional learning, we're thrilled to know that the Great Kindness Challenge can really ignite your social emotional learning program, whatever you are doing. Um, this is not something that you need to do instead of anything else. This is something you can completely add on to your current culture at your school. And we found that it actually addresses all five of the core competencies. Um, the Great Kindness Challenge is great for self-management, decision-making skills, self-awareness, social awareness, and relationship skills, and I'll get into examples of that. Um, everything we do with the Great Kindness Challenge is based on a 50-item kindness checklist. For our pre-K through one and two, the, the little ones, we have a junior edition which has 12 acts of kindness. But for all the older students, we have a 50 Act of Kindness checklist. We also have it available in an app for the middle and high school students. Um, the Great Kindness Challenge is, is a perfect example of self-management because the checklist is self-directed. Students get the checklist on Monday, and they're challenged to complete as many acts of kindness as possible by Friday. They are able to be in charge of how they want to go about doing that. So they're the ones who are directing their kindness. They're the ones who have the self-discipline to figure out how they're going to accomplish all 50 acts within the one week. And they get to make their own goals. So they set their goals. Most of the students like to go for all 50. Some think that it might be more um, appropriate for them to start with 20, and that's okay, whatever their personal goal is. And um, the motivation, there's a, a, um, a very natural motivation that happens as the students are giving kindness. They see the natural results of that kindness being received. So it really increases the motivation of doing the right thing. And then the grit. Um, in order to get all 50 acts of kindness going, you got to have a little determination, and that's um, giving the kids in a very joyful way that opportunity. Um, on our next um, core competency is the decision-making skills. Um, we, we find that students are able to analyze the situation. So as they're picking one act off of the kind of, uh, an act of kindness from the checklist, they need to analyze how they're going to go about making that happen. So everyone goes about it in a different way, and um, we have a way we have an opportunity for students to reflect on their kindness and discuss how they analyze and went about creating that kind act. Um, also, the evaluating and reflecting. Um, we're really happy that we we have this new piece this year that is a reflection um, that we've organized for you, um, and schools and teachers naturally do that as well with their students. Um, also, there's the ethical responsibility. Um, students see that they can have a role 
to play in creating that culture of kindness at their school. So they take on that responsibility and they see that everyone has um, a certain um, part to play. And then finally, the civic engagement. Um, the checklist itself is more self-directed, but we have a, an accompanied toolkit that we provide all the schools that has a lot of ideas of how to engage the whole community and how the students can do different projects to engage um, um, doing service projects for out in the community and out in the world. So now we want to give you some examples from our 50 acts of kindness on the checklist um, for the rest of the three competencies. So next with self-awareness, we've taken out four acts of kindness from the checklist to show um, examples of how we address self-awareness. One is smile at 25 people. Um, that sounds like such a simple thing to do, but we have, um, there's power and proof and what a difference that smile makes for the giver and the receiver. Um, compliment five people using the words in a positive way to reach out to another student and see the good in them. And let them know that they are important and that they, that they matter, which all kids want to know that they matter. Um, tell a joke and make someone laugh. Um, we want kids to keep the fun going in their relationships. And pat yourself on the back. We want kids to know that what they're doing um, is making a difference, and self-congratulation is an important part of that. Um, on our next core competency is social awareness. Um, our checklist has one of the acts is learn to say hello in a new language. So we're having them kids think about other cultures and um, the way that they express themselves. Um, make a wish for a child in another country. We want our kids to not just think about themselves, but thinking about others. And um, we have ways to really go beyond that and learn about some of the challenges that other kids in other countries are facing and how to really get specific of how to have compassion and empathy for the kids in another country. Um, step up for someone in need. Um, this is something, as we are making kindness a habit, we want them to naturally look and see how they can be part of making someone's life a little bit better and a little bit brighter. And um, another one is to offer to help your custodian. Um, we, we see people around us working, and we want our youth to know that they can offer help to anyone in their, in their community. And then finally, we have our relationship skills as a core competency. Um, three ways our checklist addresses that is um, saying good morning to five people. Um, that simple good morning, again, it, it is something that seems so basic, but it really goes far when kids are thinking about how they're connecting to another person. Um, sit with a new group of kids at lunch. Um, this is one of my personal favorites because I love when kids give themselves permission to go outside of their immediate circle. Um, it's another one of the beauties of the Great Kindness Challenge is it gives kids that permission to take a chance to be bold and really um, reach out of their comfort zone and make a new friend, make a new connection. And then finally, um, invite a new friend to play or hang out with you. So at space at lunch together, they get to go out and play or hang out for the older students. Um, it's really easy uh, to bring it to your school. Um, there's three steps. All you need to do is go to our website, which is greatkindnesschallenge.org, and sign up. It's a simple sign-up form. Um, it is free. Everything, all of our tools, all of our support are free. Um, then you need to print the checklist, and we have them made um, available in Spanish, and we keep expanding those languages. And um, print the checklist, distribute it to all of the students, and on January 22nd through the 26th, get busy and start spreading the kindness. Um, we believe that kindness matters, and it sounds so simple and so basic, but we know that kindness has the power to create peace on earth. And um, we are so grateful to all of you educators who are the ones who are really making the difference with the students. We're really giving them the opportunity to be their best selves. And um, we couldn't do this without you, and we're so thankful for your kindness. And um, we invite you all to be part of our Great Kindness Challenge. And and whatever you do, we are cheering you on. And I think that leads us to the questions. All right. Hello, everyone. It's Sarah again. So I want to remind you that if you have any questions, you can enter them in either the chat box or you're welcome to enter them into the Q&A box. Both of those are sort of at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we're going to start with a question we got a little bit ago for Melina, and that question is, is the Harvard Graduate School of Education offering any professional development opportunities around making caring common? And Melina, if you want to take that one. 
Sure, yeah. So at Making Care in Common, we do give talks and presentations. Um, we've done educator institutes in the past. We might revisit them in the future. Um, but, you know, one of the main reasons we develop the strategies um, have and, and, and we have the current high school campaign is to provide resources to teachers that can be accessed um, and done um, on their own in schools. Um, so for instance, um, you know, if you go to that high school campaign on our website, you'll see there are men a menu of possible choices and actions that schools can take. And if you're interested in that empathy domain, right, so promoting um, concern for others um, in your school, then you could be prompted as one of the possible actions to use one of our strategies or multiple strategies. Um, you know, currently we are um, helping to facilitate the implementation of those strategies um, in schools all around the country. Um, and we're also currently evaluating them in the process um, because continuous quality improvement is so important to us um, and what teachers have to say really matters. Um, so, yeah, so I'll, you know, I just encourage folks to um, see what we have on the website. Feel free to email me um, at, um, on that email, research at makingcareincommon.org, um, and I'll be, you know, we'll be happy to get back to people. Great. Thank you, Milena. I just want to remind everybody that if you want to get to any of the websites that have been, um, you know, any of the presenter websites, you can really easily either scroll up to the very top of this chat box, which has a lot of action going on, so that might be hard, or you can click on that stack of documents, sort of a red icon. That's going to be your handoff button, and so you can get to anything from there, which should be really helpful. So the next question we got is from Margaret Stanford Harmony, and the question was from Susan, and she asked, the curriculum being discussed um, is really primarily pre-K. However, is there a possibility that high school could potentially adapt, or is it really just elementary in nature? So, Margaret, I'll let you take that one. Okay, good question. Uh, the curriculum is pre-K through sixth grade. However, we have a lot of schools and districts using the quick connection cards all the way up through high school, and we've also uh, shared the meet up and buddy up strategies. I also left out that Harmony is also available um, online for download and in English and in Spanish. Perfect. Thank you, Margaret. So we just got another one um, for Jill from the Right Kindness Challenge. So Jill, could you speak to a little bit of the timing of the challenge? Um, can you do it outside of that designated week of the 22nd to the 26th? Go ahead, Jill, you can take that one. Yes, um, thank you for that question. And yes, the, the official week is January 22nd through the 26th. And we, the idea is that you come back from winter break and start the new year with this big happy dose of kindness. But we recognize that every school has their the best calendar for their school. And so you are able to do it whenever it is very best for your students. And you can get all the tools now and then plan accordingly. So yes, anytime kindness is great. Perfect. Now, I have another question from Elena that came in through the chat box. Um, and this one is, how do you suggest cultivating buy-in um, with other stakeholders, so districts, parents, community, and even the kids themselves? Elena, if you want to <laughs> take a stab at that one. Uh, sure. That's a really tough question. Um, obviously, you know, I know it sounds um, it, I don't want it to be such like a simple answer, but building relationships, um, I think, is crucial, um, which obviously can take time, um, but constantly talking to people that you know may be change agents within the school or in the district, um, especially who might talk to each other quite frequently. Um, I think it's important to keep talking about these things, um, to keep requesting. Um, that these sort of things be done um, and, you know, maybe like referencing some of those resources I 
I put up. So like that castle one, um, they have a really nice resource for districts, um, right? Like the sorts of things you want to consider, um, the sorts of steps you can take to make change at the district level or the school level. Um, so I think Castle has great resources for that. Um, and, you know, from our personal experience, I can say um, I've been so impressed with teachers who've come to us, you know, wanting strategies to implement in their classrooms, but they've also then gotten other teachers on board from their, class, from their schools um, to, to um, engage with the strategies as well. So that's already like catalyzing big buy-in. Um, and so, you know, I, I, there are a number of different ways, but I, I hope that answers some of the questions. That's perfect. Thank you, Melina. We have time for one more question. I'm going to squeeze it in. Casey asked, this is from Margaret, is the Harmony curriculum available in hard copy or is it only available by download? So if you could clarify that, Margaret, that'd be great. Well, the good news is that we um, will provide teacher kits um, with all of the materials, uh, the books, the stories, the Meet Up and Buddy Up Strategies booklet, and the Quick Connection cards for every classroom in a school at, new at no charge, and that is in English. And then English and Spanish are d downloadable as well. So they're great to use um, if teachers are at home and planning. So they're available both hard copy and online. Thank you, Margaret, so much. And we are out of time, so I just wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who attended this webinar. I can't believe um, all the responses that we are getting in of the things that you guys are already doing in your schools. I am so impressed and so excited for your students. And thank you so much for attending, for giving um, our speakers your time. And I want to give a big thank you to all of our speakers for being here today. We are so lucky to have all of you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye.